everyone. Welcome to part two of the two-part series with John Rossi of the Rossafari podcast. If you randomly clicked on this episode and haven't listened to part one of my conversation with John, then I highly recommend hitting pause and heading over to episode nine to hear John's story from the beginning. If you don't mind starting in the middle of the conversation or have already listened to the previous episode, then awesome. Let's keep her on going. In this part of the conversation, we dive deep into how John made the Raw Safari podcast happen, including connecting with zookeepers and conservation organizations, plus all of the hoops that are involved to make them happen. And let me tell you, there's a lot. We also chat about some personal struggles like battling mental health issues after losing his musical career to COVID and an even bigger life event, unexpectedly becoming a father. Again, if you're liking these two-part interview series or not, that's cool. Hit me up on Instagram at Rewildology or email me at hello at Rewildology.com. Let's get to the show. Wow. I mean, if that is an inspiration for anybody, if you're thinking about doing anything, and that doesn't have to be a podcast by any means, but something like that where you know that you're so passionate and there's just this burning idea that just won't leave you. And And look what can happen. I mean, it was just an idea that happened to sprout out of something pretty terrible, AKA COVID and what it did to your job, what it did to your role, what it did to your whole industry, which I can definitely relate, but you were able to find something good in the bad. You you made the lemonade with a whole bunch of lemons and went into a completely different field and connected with these amazing people. And then you've been able to do so much good because of that. It's just something that was just a hobby just to get away from people that were drunk and down and doing other extracurriculars that I don't even want. I don't even know. I mean, I know enough about the music industry to know that like some shit goes down. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And you know, the funny thing about it is too, it kind of saved me. Um, I have been since middle school, I had one goal was to be a touring drummer. And then I became a touring drummer and yay. And then it was taken away from me. And I got home from from my last tour dates on March 8th. And um, within a week, every gig that I had booked for the next year was gone. And I had worked so hard to book those gigs. And that's the thing, when you're in this industry, when you do it like I do it, you know, even when you're on tour, even when you have a nice long tour like I have, it still is only goes out for a couple weeks or a couple months and then is off. And then, so you still fill that space. I, I put in for dozens of jobs every year. It's like, if you're listening to this and you're not in that world, imagine applying for 12, 15, 20 jobs a year minimum, sometimes much more. I'm lucky that I'm successful enough where I don't have to do as much. I know actors who audition 100, 200 times a year. And then dealing with wow. all of the rejection and all of the prep for each one and and all of that. Um, and since I'm music direct, I not only have to, you know, audition or submit videos or whatever, but I also usually interview and I talk to people and I, um, yeah, it, it's like, I, oof, yeah, if you, if you, if you're a person who has had a job for multiple years, it's, it's hard to even picture what it is like to not know what your next gig is going to be and not know, you know, sometimes, um, so, so I worked really hard and I built an entire year's calendar, which most people in my industry cannot even do. And then within the course of a week, it was gone. And um, at the time, my, my girlfriend was on an externship, so she was not home. And because she had been on an externship and I had been on tour, all of our animals were with her parents. Um, so I was in a completely alone house and everything I'd worked for was taken away from me. And uh, all the zoos were closed. Um, so I couldn't even go see, see animal buddies because of COVID. Um, and it was, it was, it was a pretty tough time, but that, that I was able to turn that into, uh, eating way too much unhealthy food and also building a podcast. So, you know, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I was so desperate for animal time there. <laughs> this is going to make you laugh at me. <laughs> I am embarrassed by this fact, but there is a zoo that is near where I live. It is in Delaware. It's called uh, Brandywine Zoo. And it is a small zoo that is in a park, but it is a great zoo. It is an AZA zoo. It is, it is lovely there. And um, I was really sad about not being able to, to go to zoos. And I remembered that Brandywine Zoo is in this park. And you can kind of see a couple of the exhibits through the fence, kind of, including the Red Panda exhibit. 
And so one day I drove the 30 minutes to get there, walked over to the fence, and just stood at the fence, staring through, trying to catch glimpses of their red pandas and a couple other animals. And it worked! I got to see them! So then that became a thing that Zoe and I did a couple of times, where we went to to just stand outside a zoo to catch glimpses of animals, because that's how much we love them. We also went to Elmwood Park Zoo once or twice, because you can see their uh, their giraffes from the uh, the parking lot. And, and that's how badly I needed animals in my life at that time. Yeah. I can definitely relate. So one of the, there was a really big, so this most recent episode that I just published, we actually went very deep into mental health and um, just like her personal struggles on what she's had to go through and how she's overcome that. And I would love to talk about that a little more um, because in so many situations and so many, you know, people that might not have had an outlet, how did you how did you come out of that to get enough motivation to start this podcast? Like, what was your process for you? Like, I, I was it like, I have to do something or like, how, how did you, how did you come through that? Um, I don't think as it was happening, I was aware of the fact, but yes, that was what was going on behind the scenes. Um, and I'm just a very driven person. I mean, to make it in the industry that I've made it in, um, you have to be, you know, um, there are literally, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of people who would take my job, if not millions. And, uh, not only do I want to do it, uh, but I want to be paid well for it and I want to get to do it touring around the country. And, you know, um, it, 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 I was always super driven. And so when I started the podcast, uh, it definitely was just a, okay, cool. Now that I'm starting to do this, I'm driven and all I'm doing is studying, how to make a podcast and relearning the audio engineering tricks that I knew from recording drum stuff and applying them to this and finding my gear and figuring out what of my drum gear I could use to to record a podcast and all of that. Um, and then studying podcasts and reading. And as I'm sure you know, podcast statistics are very weird. They are not um, aggregated the same from every place that your podcast is downloaded. And it's all very strange. And there are a lot of uh, theories out there um, about, you know, what makes for a good podcast, and they often contradict each other. And um, I know we, we've we talked a yes. little bit about like the length thing, like I keep mine shorter, because I've read things that say that that is what people want. But then at the same time, like the most popular podcast out there is like Joe Rogan, and he'll go three, four hours. So who the heck knows? And and there, <laughs> there's so little data on this, this newest, newer form of you know, uh, show that it's really frustrating, but I was still out there reading every article I could and all the contradictory ones and trying to put it together. And, um, yeah, I really threw myself into it and I think it definitely helped a lot, but I don't think I realized it at the time. I'm just a driven person when I want to do something, but now looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, this is insane. And I still think it's insane. I'm doing two episodes a week. That is so much work. And um, I, I started off, I had read an article that said that when you release your podcast, release two a week for the first couple of weeks, because it gives people content, it makes them want to sign up. It, um, you know, earlier on when people find your podcast, it's easier for them to go back to the beginning and not feel overwhelmed, whatever. So I was going to do three weeks, I think, of two episodes and then go back to one. And and Zoe, my girlfriend, was like, well, I really like it. And you're putting out a good message. And I think you should keep doing two a week. And I was like, okay. And so <laughs> I, I, I was already signed up in my brain because I was like, yeah, that, that seems like better than you know, sitting on my couch being sad that I'm not playing the drums probably. And so I've kept it going. And who knows when I go back out on tour, if I'll be able to keep up that pace or if I'll go back to once a week, I, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I do two fully produced podcasts. Uh, all, I do all the work myself. Uh, Zoe listens before I release to, to check for little editing help and, and she's amazing at it. But even then I'm the one that has to make the edits, whatever. Um, and, and it's all, it's occupying my brain right now, which is, which is pretty important, you know? That's good. That's, yeah. I've had that's other great. things too. Um, I, I've done a lot of remote recording. I have uh, an electric kit here, but like a really uh, top of the line one and I can multi-track record from it and stuff. And so I, I've spent more time putting out tracks for people and, and helping composers develop stuff and, and all that than I've ever been able to. And that's been a lot of fun, but it's, it's not the same. I like creating with people. Um, 
So yeah, it's sometimes it's actually a struggle to go do those tracks because it's just not the same, you know, and it's not what I want to be doing with the drums, but at the same time, it's also really cool. It's, it's a weird mix of something I love and struggle with at the same time. But uh, yeah, mental health is definitely, um, it's definitely a bit of a struggle in COVID times when everything you've ever worked for is kind of stripped away, you know, unexpectedly. Yeah. As you know, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think is the more stories that we we can get out there because it's not talked about enough. Like the struggles that we all think that we're all just going through a struggle and that no one can relate. But just like you said, we're all going through something and somebody who's now that I would completely say is completely melted in this world, um, to have something so valuable to you taken away like that, it just goes to show oh, just how resilient you are and just finding a way and finding something to occupy your mind and moving forward. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it was like for you March 8th when you were in your place by yourself. And I mean, like, I just wish that I could have been a fly on the wall and just to see how far you've come from that moment of losing everything that you had driven. Cause I, obviously at that time, the podcast didn't exist. So it, that wasn't even an outlet yet. Um, oh no, back then so it was exciting. like, Hey, I need to figure out, uh, how to shower again and um to uh to stop ordering shitty food um because i'm a stress eater and the whole not drinking and not really engaging in other stuff that much makes me a heck of a stress eater um always have been and uh and it, it's just so damn easy now to order pizza and subs for dinner and um and you know whatever and so i was doing a lot of that yeah it was it was not a healthy time um I, there was a time in my life where I, I went through this kind of freakish car accident. And uh, after that, I, I had PTSD for about a year, but I was getting treatment and I was on drugs and it, it helped and it cleared up and, and, you know, I, I like handled it well. And with the possible exception of that time, that was definitely the darkest period of my life. I've never been a person who struggles with, with depression or anxiety too much or anything. And I think drumming really helps with that because I'm hitting things very hard and it's a very physical activity. And um, it's meditative. It is. And, and on top of that, I'm also traveling, which I love and meeting new people, which I love and having adoring audiences cheer for me, which does not suck for your self-esteem. Um, not going to lie. And um, so to not have any of that and, and not even, um, you know, I have my electric kit here, but I can't even set up an acoustic kit and really, slam the drums there's there's a big difference as you know in in playing an electric kit and playing a drum set and and just yes. destroying it <laughs> even kit. just the feeling of the hi-hat alone oh, yeah. is like it, not even close yeah, insanely different no insanely different and and i am a um the beauty of touring is that i am a heavy player like i am in big venues and i am amplified you know what they're hearing is amped so i can pound the snot out of a kit and and with proper technique and, and doing it right but um i am i am not one of these little tap the drum guys i like to play and it really does help when you're doing that five six eight times a week um you know for an hour or more um it's it's it takes a lot of the aggression out and so i i didn't have that anymore and yeah it was it was it was a real dark time um ironically uh or you know but not surprisingly i guess um it, Zoe was doing her externship at the Pittsburgh Zoo at the time, and um, I went out there to help her leave when she got shut down because of COVID. Um, and we got to go to the zoo like the day before it closed. And so suddenly I had a girlfriend again and was at a zoo again. And um, boy, did that help a lot. Uh, that that was that was the start of, of turning it around. Those first couple days were rough and every time a new email came in i just sank a little further into my couch and you know yeah it was it was an intense time thank you for sharing that and having the courage to share that and um there's another part of of your story that i know a lot of people can relate to and you can talk about it or not it's just completely up to you but when we were chatting as we were as we were like you know getting to know each other you shared with me that you unexpectedly became a father and having personally known a lot of people including some of my own closest family members having gone through something like that um and i know a lot of people listening have probably gone through something similar 
So could you, could you take me through that? What that was like for you? I know, I know that you absolutely love your son now. And I mean, not that you did it then that that came out completely wrong, but if you could just, just take me back to that and, and how you worked through that and, um, you know, and how that that's worked with your life now. Sure. So I was, um, I was in a marriage and it was, um, not great. And, um, I, I was pretty much sure I was on my way out. And, um, there were certain things that adults have to do in order to have a child that we were not engaging in. Um, and then, uh, one night, much to my surprise, the opportunity to, to do so ha- happened. And, um, wouldn't you know it not not only was the last time that ever happened between us but uh there was a a a lovely little consequence that 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 happened from that um oh the irony of life (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah and um you know to me i don't know it was just another thing that was happening in life i am not much of a worrier and i live very much in the moment um sometimes keeping up my spreadsheet on who my my next couple interviews are is a bit of a challenge for me um one thing i love about tour is you have a person who sends you a a, a daily or a weekly of what your schedule is going to be and then you just have this magical thing that you don't have to think you before you go to bed you look at what your next day is and you find out when you have to wake up and what city you're going to and how you're getting there and uh then you can quickly research if there's a zoo or an aquarium and uh then you go to sleep and <laughs> like it's it's lovely and it takes no planning on your part which is amazing um and so for me the whole thing was just kind of surreal um and this happened uh, i was traveling a little bit for gigs but i wasn't like touring yet And so I was still so focused on drumming and that life that it was almost like this side thing where I was like, oh, look, she's more pregnant now. Cool. And like, this is interesting. And I guess there's going to be a kid sometime. And, um, you know, my son, Miles, was born um, in the night after a show where I played a show Saturday night. And I had a, um, a matinee Sunday and I had to leave by like I don't know, say 1020 to make it to the the matinee. And he was born at 1018. And um, I still made that matinee. Like that is how focused I was on drumming and my career and and all of that. Um, And it was such an unexpected thing um, to me, especially because like I said, I wasn't really by living in the moment, I wasn't even thinking about like, oh, what is it going to be like? Like, if, you know, you have nine months to realize like, oh, you're going to, you're gonna, there's going to be this other human. But I, I don't really work that way. That's not how my mind works. And so, you know, at some point there was a, a pregnant person in my house. And at some point there was a not pregnant person and then a baby. And um, uh, I got my first tour shortly thereafter and and hit the road. And it was all very very weird time and i i did not really know what it was going to be like to be a dad or anything it was it was confusing um i had a lot to learn uh i had a lot of responsibility like i truly believed that i want to be a good dad and i want to you know um love this kid and i want to to raise this kid as best i can and everything uh but i also found myself in a situation where um I was unhappy in a relationship and I thought, if I stay here, will I be doing a service or will I resent this child and will he be raised in a house where he sees people who aren't truly in love? Because it was, that was definitely mutual, Um, you know, and I really, and we talked about it and like we had an honest conversation and it was not an easy conversation. Um, and in the end I was like, yeah, no, I, I think I want to, I want to get the divorce. And, uh, and so that was a thing and, um, it was very interesting. Uh, and then I remember I would come home from tour and I would go and pick up this little wiggly potato and, um, you know, try to connect with it. And, and I did not know how to do that. 
Um, so I studied and I, I, I learned and, and as he got older, it got easier. And, and now he is, you know, the absolute, uh, joy and, and love in my life. And I, I, I look forward to every day with him. And, um, during COVID I've had way more opportunities to spend even more time with him and it's always amazing and exhausting. And, um, you know, ironically, his mother and I get along way better now than we did for a lot of our relationship, um, which is super cool. And I, I really appreciate it, especially during COVID, because we, you know, normally I would go up and take him out to restaurants and stuff and um, can't really do that. So now that it's nope. gotten colder, so uh, the, the four or if Zoe can come up, the five of us sit and have dinner together. And, um, you know, she's remarried now. And um, and so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's our big goofy family and, and we make it work. And, uh, I, I, I think it's pretty cool. And, um, you know, I think it's also cool that Miles gets to see me, uh, you know, his, his mom's a very traditional mom and his stepdad is a very, um, traditional guy in a lot of ways. He, he likes to build stuff, which I'm like, other than Legos, I'm lost. <laughs> and he works uh, nine to five and, and is, uh, you know, good at his job and, and works at a computer. And, and Miles gets to see all of that from, from them and then gets to see Zoe and I out there chasing our dreams and her becoming a vet and me doing this podcast, which he can listen to on, on Spotify and, and hear my voice and, uh, and knows that I'm on tour and he's come out and seen a couple of the shows that I've toured with now and, um, gotten to travel a little bit to do that. And, and I think it's really cool that, you know, he's growing up getting to see the more traditional thing. And then also like what can happen if you're a dream chaser, you know, and, and if you're, a little bit on the fringe, but in a good way and can make it work. And, and I think that's awesome. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's almost like making me emotional because even though I don't necessarily have my own children, I view my, my role in my nieces and nephews life very similar because I'm like the out there. I mean, my mom calls me like her hippie flower child. Like they don't even know, like they don't even know how to introduce me. Like, so what do your daughters do? And they have no idea what to say that I do. And I'm like, I don't even freaking know what I do. <laughs> and so just showing that, you know, cause we talked before about how such a small town that I'm from and, and how a lot of people don't see a different way. And so for you to imprint that in your son at such a young age is so special and so powerful for what he might want to do in the future. Yeah, it makes me really happy. And I do see in him now, so he's six now and he wants to be a video game designer. I see the same drive. He's, he's absolutely locked on that. And he, um, you know, he has a journal that he keeps about his game ideas and he wants to play video games and he wants to talk about video games. And sometimes he'll be telling me a story about his his mom, like a real story, like, oh, this happened and we were talking about school and then suddenly Mario shows up and I'm <laughs> like, wait a minute, um, you know, but like he has that same focus that I have and that same drive that I have. And um, who knows? He's six. Who knows what's going to happen? But I do like that. I can show him like, Hey, this is a thing that you want to do, whatever that thing is. Uh, cool. Go do it. That's what I'm doing. And I did it with music and now I'm doing it with the podcast and, um, yeah, you can too, buddy. You know, that's cool. I just had this idea that just hit me like right this very second. When COVID decides to shut up her ugly face, when... <laughs> Is there like a way or like, have you thought about a way to marry your two lives of like music and this conservation world that you're coming down? I'm, I'm just like, I'm just thinking out loud. This idea is materializing right now, but I'm sure you've had time to think about it. Oh, I've have been working on stuff. I've, I've been working on stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've talked to... Um, <laughs> Anything I can know about? <laughs> well, I mean, it's all it's all up in the air. You know, my, my original podcast idea, like I said, was as I tour to go to these facilities, you know, have it all planned out in advance and, and do my interviews there. And um, I think that would just be incredible. Um, I think that will make for such a richer show than, than what I'm able to do now, even though I really love what I'm able to do right now. Um, and so that's part of it. And then also, um, 
you know, I've talked to a lot of the conservation organizations that I've interviewed and stuff and pointed out like, oh, hey, if you ever need voiceover work or, um, you know, if if you're making films or educational stuff and you want someone to compose music for it, background music for it, I do all of that. And I I can either do it myself or I have friends who are amazing and frankly, who owe me because I've done a lot of free or very cheap drumming <laughs> for them. Um, yeah. And so... You know, um, like my buddy Taylor and I, we do a lot of work together. He's uh, the guy who does the acapella interrupting John Stinger that I have in my show sometimes. Um, he plays guitar and bass and piano and, and I play drums and I arrange and I play some synthy stuff. And we've done podcast themes for people and we've been the backing band for people. And I've got great guitarists and stuff who I can hire on top of that if I want. And um you know, I also just make my own stuff. When I did Rasafari After Dark, um, the the little like sexy porno music that I did for it, that was all <laughs> me. I did it all myself, programmed it all, sat sitting here, you know, having a blast with it. Um, and so I can provide those types of things to conservation organizations to for their films, for, you know, and I've got a decent voice. I could do some VO stuff. I know how to record. I know how to do all of that. So um, I've been talking to people. Uh, about that um, a little bit. And then the other part is just the beauty of, of touring is that I, I it's not like I'm working 52 weeks a year, you know? Um, even my best tours, I'm going to have a month off here. I'm going to have three weeks off here or whatever. And so one of the things that I'm trying to figure out how to do both now and then is be more a part of the um, conservation community. I want to start doing... Uh, some actual traveling and actually working on stuff. And I think there would be nothing cooler than volunteering for Project X and going and doing, you know, whatever they need. Oh, and also interviewing someone and talking about my time in the field there and making a podcast episode about it. Um, you know, and then also while we're there, you know, let's say I was working, let's say I was, was partnering with Oh Copy Conservation. Uh, they do a lot of radio broadcasts. Can I, can I help them with some music? Can I help, you know, there are so many ways to, to marry the two. Um, so yeah, I think about it a lot and I, I look forward to figuring all of that out. That's awesome. That's so good because I see them as very complimentary things. Like, I mean, the fact that, I mean, you already had all of these skills. I mean, yeah, podcasting is like a different thing, but you already had so many skills going into it, which is so exciting. And going down this field, I mean, it's sometimes super hard to look in any other direction, you know, to know how to do any type of production or any type of music thing, even if it is somebody's passion. And I don't know many people in the zoo field that also have in-depth music production skills in any way, shape or form. So you are probably an insanely valuable resource for anybody you met because now you're going to be in the back of their mind anytime they need help with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm really <laughs> hoping that they will take advantage because I get, I get such a thrill from it. Um, my favorite things, hands down, with this podcast haven't been meeting animals, which I thought it would be, um, but have been the moments where somebody reaches out, like I said, and is like, oh, hey, I got my stimulus check today, and my husband and I don't need it, so uh, we donated it split between this zoo and Red Panda Network, both of which we heard about on your uh, your podcast. Or, you know, um, like I said, just making connections in the conservation field um, for people to, to help each other and grow and support each other, and uh, those things just... Every time something like that happens, I just like, I, I, I can't believe it. It's just so cool. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And so, and so when it comes to your podcast too, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what has been the, the really, really big highs and the really big lows? Because coming into something that, I mean, I'm still such a newbie at as well. I mean, I'm, God, I'm such a newbie. Um, but what has been like the, the hardest part of it? And I, I know you've already said so many amazing things that's happened so far, but what would you say is, is the best? What is the yin and the yang to, to going down this path and launching Bra Safari? Sure. The, the best is just the overall impact. Um, knowing that, you know, the, the podcast has been downloaded over 12,000 times and, and people are learning and people care and people share it. And every once in a while, I'll be like, scrolling around on Instagram and someone who I don't know has shared my thing. And, and I'm like, who, 
who are you and why are you helping me? And it's because of the message. And that's awesome. And I love it. And it makes me so happy. Um, so just all of that, whether it's the, the money, you know, for organizations or the connections, all, all the stuff I just talked about, all of that. Also, the animal time is pretty freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> pretty dope. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty uh, stoked about all of that. Um, the hardest part has been every once in a while someone will misunderstand something or or will um you know um in a recent episode that i did uh about um protecting uh golden frogs in panama um i, I spoke to the the two people two of the people who are, are actually working on the ground in panama um to save these frogs uh, from kitrid and their story is so sad in a way um because a couple of times now, as things have been going really well, some egotistical jerk got in the way and um, let his human ego hurt the animals. And and it's really had a negative impact. And they share it. Uh, highly recommend checking that episode out. And um, it's heartbreaking, but also, you know, encouraging, as many, you know, uh, conservation stories are. Um, and I've run into that a little bit myself. There was one organization where it was signed off on and they, they did the podcast and... and um, I guess one boss did not know about it and did not appreciate a couple of the answers that were given, although they were accurate, but they feel that they need to be more secret about stuff. And I had to cut some minutes out of that podcast, which I don't mind doing, but the person who, um, was actually the interview, uh, subject, they really, really crapped on that person and they were super mean about it and it's you know I, I didn't mind cutting the content that i you know i'm happy to help i've i've done some i i've sometimes been the one suggesting cuts because people get a little carried away with what they say sometimes and you know i'm 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 here for that i'm here to to, to support the organizations but yeah there was one organization where the person was just kind of a jerk to uh, the person that did the interview and and it breaks my heart knowing that a conservation organization that I love and respect and I still do has a person you know in the leadership ranks who really caused a lot of drama for no reason for absolutely no reason I've, I've checked in with other people from other organizations and kind of explained the story without naming names or anything and uh, no one else thought any of it should have been a problem no one even else thought anyone else uh, anything else should have been cut but again I didn't mind the cuts so I'm happy to do that you know um, but really ruined this 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 young person's week and and uh, made this person question some stuff and and um, made me feel really bad and all of that's really unfortunate um, but that happens in conservation. Like I said, I, I've learned that not just in my world, but from talking to conservationists that, um, you know, there, I, I know another person, uh, one of the keepers I've interviewed, I'm not going to say more than that, but who was, was working with animals that, that were their absolute favorite. They absolutely loved, they absolutely wanted to, to be there forever. And their boss was such a jerk to them that they transferred to animals they don't care about as much. And that, that's not cool. That's not fair. That's not nice. Um, and I'm, I'm only hearing one side of the story, but I'm hearing it with enough tears and enough um, details to, to, you know, believe it. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a shame. So there are not many people that I've met in this industry or heard about in this industry that are, are opportunists or egotistical jerks or whatever, but they do exist. And I've run into it a little bit. And, and that, that really sucks. Um, and then there was one other time where I didn't communicate a uh, vision clearly and had a, a, a person who's become a friend um, clap back a little bit. And that that stung for a couple of days, but I'm good at the conversations and we opened it up and all is well. But, you know, I care so much about what I do and I'm so passionate about it and I believe that it's important. Um, enough people have told me that where I've actually started to believe it because sometimes it's easy to doubt yourself that, you know, I do take it personally. And it, it, it's hard when something like that happens. Now, I just released my 63rd episode and and I've had exactly two experiences that were, were personally painful. I've heard about other ones that bother me, but I've had two that were bothersome and one of which is cleared up and, and you know, completely fine. So I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Um, but but that one moment does stand out. And, you know, there there are nights when I'm, I'm editing a podcast at 3.30 in the morning and... Uh, wondering you know remembering that moment and being like is this even worth it and i know it is but but for every awesome experience and for every awesome comment and message uh a, a whole lot of those can be 
stomped out by one real shitty experience, you know? Absolutely. On that similar note, like having been in the zookeeping field, how how have you figured out how to work zoo politics? I'm just going to just leave that question there and I'll just let you answer. <laughs> I'm so dang lucky that I am an outsider and even more lucky that I can be pretty charming when I want to be. Because the thing that I have found is that every PR department handles things differently. And if you don't follow their procedures, you'd better be ready to apologize and explain why you didn't and, and, and you know, be super sweet about it and super nice. And I, I, I am. Everyone knows. You know, I think if you listen to the podcast, especially, if you give me a chance, you're going to understand who I am. And then we're cool. But yeah, like I will tell you, um, Zoo Atlanta, uh, the woman who runs their PR is this woman named Rachel, and she is amazing. She helped me so much. However, at Zoo Atlanta, you have to go through Rachel to talk to people. And like there was a time that I mentioned to her that a keeper spoke to me about wanting to be on the podcast. And she very kindly but reminded me, hey, John, don't talk to keepers, talk to me. And I was like, oh, no, I know this. This person reached out to me and I'm immediately reaching out to you. And it was totally cool. But like that is how strict it is. You know, a casual conversation still has to be routed through the right thing. Um, at Columbus, they're helping me set up a couple of interviews right now uh, for, for post-COVID, and they've been incredible. But you absolutely have to go through the right people there. At other zoos, like at Nashville, I've talked to a bunch of people there, and they just have to make sure they get approval from who they need. But I've, I've never talked to a PR person at Nashville, and I think I've done six or seven interviews there. You know, um, Their keepers need to go through the right channels and all that, but I'm not involved at all. So it's it's really funny. And then some zoos are like county-owned or, or whatever, and um, – and then I'm going through government people, and that's that's all the weird. And yeah, some some want to call and have an hour long interview with me before they agree to it. And other people already know who I am, and other people just love the vision. And every single zoo is different. And I I learned early on that um, the best thing to do is talk to a keeper directly or to someone directly and find out what their zoo does. Um, because that way I'm not, you know, stumbling through and, and making mistakes in the process. Um, but it's it's a journey. And I have definitely had everyone. I've been lucky that everyone I've talked to has been very polite about it. But there have definitely been moments of like, Mr. Rossi, if you want to talk to somebody from our zoo, you are welcome to. We will set it up for you. We will help you. But please, please remember that you need to reach out directly to me between the hours of 9 and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Oh um, I cannot guarantee that I'll see an email that comes in afterwards. So please, please accommodate us and we will accommodate you. And it's like, okay, I, I can do that. I, I did not realize oh, yeah. that. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Whatever. I'm, I'm here for it. I just didn't realize because I'm, I'm setting up interviews at six zoos right now and you have six different policies and my, my poor little head has just turned into one of those head explosion emojis. It's fine. Whatever. But I do get away with a whole lot of, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Hi, I'm just trying to help. I'm let's do it. I will be the best partner. Just tell me how, you know, I, and I, and I mean it, I'm very sincere about that. So I, I think most people can read that. I'm definitely not phony in my passion about this. And I think it helps. That's great. I'm sure that was one of those, because uh, you and I chatted about the things that you don't have any clue is coming down when you start a new path like this. And, and I'm sure that was one of them. You're just like, what? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, I have to go through what? <laughs> like, my best friend is, he works in PR, not for a zoo or anything, but that is like what he does. And when I was telling him about this, he's like, oh, this is so great. Zoos probably have, um, you know, either small or understaffed PR departments, and everyone is going to love you. Free PR is the best thing in the world. And he's been mostly right. But like I said, some have, have specific, some are just like, no. There is, there was a zoo that let their keeper do an interview with me as long as I didn't mention their zoo name. And that blows my mind. Why would you not want the free publicity? You know, some zoos want to preview the episodes first, and I'm fine with that. I'm very accommodating, and I respect that. Um, I just ask that they respect my time as well, which they always have. Um, but why would you just automatically say, no, you know, this person can talk to you, but you cannot say the name of the zoo? Uh, why would you not want that free publicity? You know, it, it yeah. blows my mind, especially 
as a, a pretty established podcast at this point. Like, you know, people know what's up. And I find most times if I talk to somebody at a zoo and they haven't heard of me, if they ask around, somebody's heard of me. So, you know, we're getting there. But yeah, it's it's very interesting, um, some of that, that politics stuff. And some zoos make me put um, amendments onto the... Uh, the release form that I have signed by, by my guests and others have me sign release forms. And a few have, like I said, wanted to preview the episodes or, you know, the one organization, like I said, had some stuff cut after it went live, which it's fine, whatever. It, every one of them is unique and different and, and it's hilarious to me. It's even, even in how they treat me. Some of them act like they're doing me a big favor and some, you know, I show up and they have a catered lunch rate waiting for me and they've lined up everything oh, wow. and they've like, yeah, Fort Worth Zoo treated me like I was a, um, a famous person. I'm, I, oh. I got a private tour of the zoo with two people and, and got to meet ambassador animals and they set up a whole room for me for the whole day and they had, had lunch waiting for me and um, wow. yeah, it, it was amazing. And then other ones are very much like... All right, sir, we can help you this one time. Just tell us when. And that's fine, too. And I love that a lot of times when that happens, then they see their follower count increase or, you know, somebody reaches out to them with a donation or something. And then they're like, oh, and and then then the relationships get, get a little better. Sometimes even just hearing the interview Opens helps. Up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I get it. And I blame... Um, I blame Blackfish for a lot of this, um, you know, that that caused a lot of damage to an amazing rescue organization and conservation organization. And um, there's there's a lot of drama around it. And people who were interviewed for it have come out against the film and said they were taken, you know, edited um, and and to say things they didn't really say. And uh, a lot of the footage was not from SeaWorld, but from uh, non-regulated facilities. And unfortunately, I think a lot of zoos took that information and went, OK, we need to go on the defensive. And so I do think that a lot of times people are like, who are you? What are you trying to do? And are you going to hurt our zoo? And once they see that, I'm like, hell no, then it's cool. But I do have to break through that initial thing. And even then, you know, I'm still not allowed to take pictures in certain places or not allowed to record in certain places or whatever. And I get it. I'm fine with all of that. I wish there was more openness in the zoo community. I, I think it would help. Um so that the next time somebody does a hatchet job like like blackfish that uh people will will already you know be like no that's actually we we see what these guys do and it, but i get it and i get it from both sides and i know how devastating it was to sea world which is one of the few organizations out there with enough money and power to survive something like that you know if that had happened at, at a small zoo or something it would just be wiped off the map so yeah yeah like it <laughs> That's why I just I just had to pose the question that way because I just know from experience that every single zoo is different, and I can only imagine talking to so many people at this point just just what you've experienced. Oh yeah, it's always entertaining, and there's there are a lot of times that I, I I've had to learn to be more organized. Like I said, like I keep a spreadsheet and everything. I'm that's not normally what I do in my life. I very much shoot from the hip. Like I said, I'm not much of a planner or anything, uh, but I definitely need to know when it's time to email Rachel. And when it's okay to follow up with her versus when I should reach out directly to a keeper versus when it's the education department who's going to be the best for me. And, you know, it, it um, it's real interesting sometimes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So it just goes, yeah, she's just such an inspiration. The fact that you release two episodes a week, like now that you've just talked about like we really laid out what it is that you go through <laughs> and you also have to do you know have to get through some hurdles along the way to even get the episode recorded like it's it's amazing it just goes to show that your heart's really in it you oh know? yeah it, it is yeah <laughs> great so what are your goals from here what what do you think yeah <laughs> what's in your sights now so I just want to keep growing the podcast for now is number one. And I have been having a lot of fun doing extra stuff. So I did an interview uh, with a band, uh, Sammy Ray and the Friends, where it was mostly focused on music. But then we did have a long talk about um, how awesome zoos are. And I kind of got to educate on, on some conservation stuff. And that was really fun. And uh, I did Rossafari After Dark, like I mentioned, which was the more adult-themed stuff about... Um, 
you know, sex at the zoo and, and mating behaviors and all that stuff. Uh, and I did raw safari around the world where I talked to keepers in other countries and different people and just, uh, I don't know, just little stuff like that that I think is fun and cool and helps grow the brand. I have thoughts, though. Um, like, I, I, I have this idea in my head about doing uh, raw safari reads where I would read a children's book as a short podcast, um, but like a conservation or animal book. Um, kind like of like one of Dave Johnson's. Or yes, something exactly. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And and Dave, you know, when he talked about those books, was kind of when I was like, oh, that could be cool. And I love uh, Lavar Burton reads the podcast, which, which is reading Rainbow for Adults, basically. And so that that put that idea in my head, and I was like, oh, that could be a fun thing to do. Um, and then, like I said, I've started doing more. Um, conservation organizations rather than just zoos. And I have this dream of eventually being able to go into the field and doing um, in situ conservation work uh, while recording and while, you know, making it all one big thing. Um, so that's, that's, that's the podcast goals. Um, obviously, I think the more just the more humans that know about it, that hear about it, that listen, that love it, that find my pictures, uh, that interact, that's a big part of it. So a whole lot of what I do right now is figuring out how to to make my my you know presence more seen and felt and heard and and doing Instagram stories and trying to get people to share and and doing some brand ambassador stuff where they'll share my stuff and I'll share their stuff and and partnering with somebody like you and you know all of that. Yes, um, it's been so fun. Yeah, so fun and so so helpful. Hopefully for both of us, you know, and and yes. just growing growing the brand would be really cool. Um, and then. Yeah, beyond that, I don't really know. I know that I really want to do more in conservation and I want to be more hands on. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the field is very prohibitive. Uh, it's very hard to even become a zookeeper. You need a bachelor's degree at a lot of places. You need years of experience volunteering. And to get volunteering, you need to uh, have a, a semi schedule, like a semi regular schedule. And as a touring musician, I can't do that. So, um, I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Uh, but I also, you know, two months ago, didn't know that I'd be publishing articles for Red Panda Network. And seven months ago, didn't know that my podcast would make it more than uh, a month. You know, I, I had a dream. <laughs> I was going to do a season of it. It was going to be 12 episodes. And if I could get through 12 episodes, then I was going to take a break and reevaluate and see how it was going. And I'm 63 episodes in and haven't slowed down and still in season one and never took that break. And, you know, so I'm just I'm kind of seeing where it takes me right now. But I'm really hoping it opens up some opportunities. I would love nothing more than to be able to, you know, have the podcast pay for itself and maybe make a little extra off of it and start donating some some of that money into conservation and stuff like that and grow my name in the conservation community and the zoo community in a lot of ways. And then also, you know, be a drummer. That's the life. Well, you're doing it. Let's keep saying it out loud. Ooh. Let's manifest it. Let's manifest it. We're going to make this happen for you, John. You're doing it. This is I feel great. like it's definitely happening. I could not, I cannot believe where I am seven months into this journey. I cannot believe it. It's insane. Yes. And and I know, like, you know, I talked about a lot of the big stuff that's happened and the cool things and the, the, the donations and all that stuff. But also, like, just every once in a while, I'll get a text from somebody and they'll be like, hey, I just had a meeting with this person and uh, they also know you from the podcast and uh, we spent 20 minutes talking about you and, and how you're making an impact and how great it is and how the world needs more people like you. And what, how is that a thing? How is that, how is that a thing? You know, um, especially now, like, yeah, I had no clue what this would become. Uh, so I can't wait. I have no clue where it will go, but I can't wait to see. That's great. That's great. So do you have any advice or I know we've talked about so much, but for anybody listening, if you could share anything with anybody listening, what would that be? I have two things that I always like to share. This is my message, which is to find and follow your passion. I have made a lot of sacrifices in doing so. And, and a lot of things that have happened in my life are things that maybe people wouldn't want to go through uh, in order to do it. But I get to do what I love to do every day, uh, you know, in a non-COVID world. And, um, and I literally can say, 
live in the dream. Like, you know how people always say, oh, how are you today? And you go, ugh, live in the dream. And it's always sarcastic. I say it and I'm not being sarcastic. I'm legitimately living my dream and that is insane. It's so cool. I love it so much. Um, so follow your passion. And if it doesn't work, that's cool. At least you followed it. I think the most bitter people that I know and the saddest people I know are the people who just gave up without trying. Try. You know, there are ways to make things work. There are ways to, to, to do it, but follow your passion. And then the other thing, the, the best advice that I give to people, um, on, deeper than that, because that's, that's very, you know, new agey, follow your passion, man, make it happen. Um, but, uh, is find your niche because Ross Safari would not be successful if this podcast already existed, you know? Um, and I mean, there are close ones. There are definitely ones where it's, it's similar-ish i could see how you could think oh this is this is you know this podcast or that whatever but um i found a niche and i i can define what that niche is not just the the zookeeper angle of it but also being an outsider and learning and you're coming along on my journey in this podcast and that's really something that doesn't exist and that's really cool and um you know i think when you find a niche that you can fill uniquely then there's a reason for people to interact with you as opposed to, you know, I'm a good drummer and I have certain styles and stuff that I'm a very good drummer, but so are thousands of other people, you know? And so even in that world to really build a career that's sustainable, because most people that act, most people that are musicians, even the ones that tour, even the ones that are considered successful still are also waiters or, um, you know, have some day job, whatever it may be. And I do not. And um, the way I've been able to sustain that is I, I found a very specific niche in the, the actor musician community as a onstage drummer who is able to, to be kind of the onstage rock star -y drummer. And sometimes I have to act and I can say the lines and I can be convincing. And I do a lot of stick tricks when I'm playing and I, do, I am a show on stage. And most people that are in theater are not that way. And most people that are drummers that are that way are not in theater. By being a theater drummer that is that way, I found a niche. And there are others out there, but there are also enough shows out there where, where you, could, you could support the small number of us. So by doing that, I, I built a career that is, is really solid, you know? And um, so, yeah, I think finding your niche, whether it's the podcast, whether it's how I'm doing most of my drumming, uh, that, that's been the biggest thing for me. That's gorgeous. Yes. Thank you. Find it what it is. Find what it is. That's great. So how can anybody connect with you? If anybody listening wants to connect with John Rossi, how, how do they do well, that? The, uh, there, there's obviously, you know, the website is uh, rossafari.com. And um, also, if you're interested in my music, there's rossidrums.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram, uh, at rossafari, also on Facebook. Um, I think there's a Twitter, but I don't really use it much. But it's all at rossafari. Uh, and um, rossafaripod at gmail.com is my email address. And if you have... Uh, guest ideas or or are somebody who think you would make a good guest. I've been enjoying, I've had more people reaching out to me lately about being on the podcast and boy, does that make my life easier. So please, if you think you would be a good guest, <laughs> reach out. I would enjoy, you know, seeing if, if we think it would be a good fit. But then the biggest thing is just go, go listen to the podcast. It's available everywhere. It's called Rossafari, R-O-S-S-I-F-A-R-I. And uh, it's it's literally on every available app that does podcasts. It's, you know, Apple and Google and Spotify and um, Amazon Music and Pandora and all the places. Um, it's even on Audible if you're an audiobook fan. Uh, go, go grab some episodes. Take a listen. I, I think it's a good time. And um, if you hit subscribe... Even if it's not your favorite thing in the world, and even if you think my voice is grating or whatever, uh, it'll still download the episode, and that actually still helps me get other people to see it and get the word out there. And, um, you know, that's really important. The, the, the going in and supporting each other in the conservation community in little free ways like that matters so much and you know tell me about your group i will like it i will i will follow you on facebook i will follow on instagram whatever it may be like let's help each other out let's build our numbers let's show the overall world that the conservation world is bigger and more connected because all of these things podcasts and instagram and facebook and all that run off of really annoying algorithms and the best way to get past that is to engage with each other couldn't have said it better myself. That was perfect. That was perfect. So everybody go out, you know, reach out 
Taka John, he's incredible. I recently was just uh, interviewed as well. And so we're going to be sharing each other's stories. Ooh. So that's very exciting. And I guess I really haven't shared my story actually on, on my own podcast, which I think is really interesting. So I actually, my story? I realized that so many people were, were wanting to learn more about me and hear more about me. And like, people were giving me feedback saying they love the episode, but like, who are you that, um, I actually had one of my guests interview me on my own podcast. Um, and I called it the reverse interview and people loved it. I was shocked, but nice. people loved it. Yeah. It was, it was a fun idea. Oh, that's great. I'll have to like ear talk about this. It's like maybe a future episode. Yeah. yeah. But yes, everybody go, go listen to John, um, on Rastafari. It's, it's such a great show. It is so fun, especially your after dark series. <laughs> God, it's so fun. Also some, um, guests that you've already heard. Johnny Payne is on yours as well as Dave Johnson. Everybody loves Dave Johnson. So if you want to hear like a different, a different side of their stories, go check out Rastafari. Um, but yeah. Thanks so much, John, for Absolutely. Coming on. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>